Welcome everyone to this Nutrition for Growth side event. I'm Roberta Bove, lead of the Nutritious Food Financing Program at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN for short. Before we get started, I would like to quickly cover a few housekeeping items. We have made translations available in Japanese and French, and you can select your preferred language by clicking on the globe item at the bottom of your screen. As you know, this is an invite-only event, as we wanted to have a small group conversation, hence allowing voices to be heard and questions to be answered. For Q&A, please write your question in the Q&A box. My colleagues will answer you in writing, and we will select some of the questions to answer live during the session. Finally, we will be recording this session, and you will be able to access it on GAIN's website. In the next hour, our speakers will explore the Nutritious Food Financing Facility, also known as N3F, including a discussion of its blended finance design, its offering beyond financing, as well as its impact framework and tools. So firstly, I would like to ask Lawrence Haddad, Executive Director at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, to talk about GAIN's journey with N3F and to explore why we felt it was important to take this new approach to investment in nutrition. Thank you, Roberta, and um, uh, um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to spend four, uh, five minutes making four points. So, so first of all, why does the world need N3F? Um, well, the, the Global Nutrition Report estimates that one in three people worldwide are malnourished. The UN estimates that 3 billion people cannot access healthy diets. And so it's no, no real surprise that weak access to nutritious and safe food is, is a common denominator for all of these forms of malnutrition. And COVID, climate, and conflict are putting a lot of pressure on these already serious numbers. So how do we change this? And how do we improve access to safe and nutritious food for all, especially the most vulnerable? Now, there are many things to do, and this n for g summit process that we're in and the summit itself will focus on most, if not all of them. But one engine we haven't yet sufficiently stoked and harnessed to nutrition is small and medium enterprises or SMEs. And we need to. Why is that? Well, I believe we need to do that because SMEs are the quiet revolutionaries in the food system. They're in the Goldilocks zone, right? They're big enough to be very important for those at risk of malnutrition, but they're not so big that they can exert undue negative influence on governments and consumers. So they make an essential contribution to, live, to delivering nutritious, safe foods to domestic markets, and they can do much, much more with the right incentives. Now, we know from the bank, the World Bank SME database, from various market surveys, from surveys conducted by the Sun Business Network and via direct feedback from the SMEs themselves, they find it really hard to access affordable loans. For example, GAIN estimates that only 0.2%, 0.2% of all global impact investing finance goes to African companies for the supply of safe, nutritious foods for domestic consumption. So there's a gap and it's one that needs filling. Second point, why gain? And I asked, this, I asked my team this very same question three years ago. And the answer after many conversations with existing funds and existing mechanisms is that they thought, the existing players thought nutrition was simply too risky. They didn't have pipeline for SMEs that supplied nutritious foods to domestic low-income consumers. They didn't know how to provide support to SMEs in the nutrition space, and they didn't know how to develop and assess practical nutrition metrics. And GAIN had extensive experience in doing all three of these things. So we decided to set up N3F as an impactful fund in its own right, but also as a proof of concept, because the world needs a thousand N3Fs, not just one. But as for any journey, the first step is the, is the most transformative and is often the hardest. Third point, how do we go about developing N3F? Well, you know, GAIN is an uh, international NGO. We're not a fund manager. So we designed a process to select a fund manager to be an equal partner 
in N3F with us. And it was a process that involved many people on this call. And we're very grateful for your advice. And we're thrilled to be working with Incofin Investment Management to develop and launch the fund. And Incofin is a trusted and experienced partner, a licensed investment fund manager, having over 20 years of experience in private debt and equity investment in emerging markets with, a, with 1 billion euros in assets under management. Uh, they are a fantastic complement to GAIN's expertise in nutrition. So finally, my last point, Roberta, then back to you, where are we now? Well, we've secured investments for the TA component, thanks to the Ministry of, Finance, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the Netherlands, Irish Aid, Rockefeller Foundation and USAID. We have initial investments in the first loss tranche of the fund, including an allocation of some of GAIN's own reserves. And that's an indication of how committed we are to N3F. We have a strong pipeline of SMEs. We had this prior to N3F and we've been developing it intensively ever since. We have a powerful and practical set of nutrition metrics. And we have a fund that is focused on nutrition, but in ways that seek to be transformative of gender relations and environment practices. Why is that? Well, on gender, it's a vital dimension. We know that women are discriminated against in access to information, access to loans, access to equity, and that's a violation of their rights. But we also know that if we equalize opportunities for women, it improves nutrition for all. And on environment, well, we just think it's absolutely vital we link nutrition to other constituencies to grow nutrition's influence to seek wins for people planet and prosperity at the same time so today we are joined by two of our staunchest allies usaid and the eleanor crook foundation and we are so grateful for their inspirational ecosystem leadership as well as their financial support so colleagues, that's the journey we've been on. We're just beginning. Um, we'll soon be ready to launch the fund and we look forward to you joining us on this long and, and impactful journey for nutrition. Roberta, back to you. Thank you, Lawrence, for sharing your insight story on why GAIN decided to develop N3F. Basically, we're spoiling to a challenge we see in the markets we operate in as most agriculture and food funds do often focus on export crops, often with limited nutritional value, such as coffee, that are not meant for consumption by people in low-income countries where they are produced. So N3F has been designed as a new approach to investment in nutrition, and it is indeed critical to have great organizations supporting us in this journey. As uh, Lawrence highlighted, one of the first backers of N3F that joined us today in this call is USAID. And I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Sean Baker, Chief Nutritionist at the United States Agency for International Development. We'll talk about why a facility like N3F is critical in addressing the needs of SMEs who are part of the solution to malnutrition in Sub-Saharan Africa. Over to you, Sean, please. Uh, thank you so much, Roberta, and thank you, Lawrence, for the the remarks, the opening remarks, and to all of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition or GAIN for organizing this event. And I think it's particularly timely right now as we build up to Nutrition for Growth. Uh, there is one of the central pillars of Nutrition for Growth, which is diets, which we need to address, and a an, uh, cross-cutting pillar is innovative financing. So it's particularly timely that we look at very concrete models of how we can innovate in financing for nutrition. Uh, I will touch on some of the points that Lawrence has already made. Uh, I often characterize it having worked in uh, public health nutrition for almost four decades now. So much of what we do in public health nutrition is trying to dig ourselves out of a hole created by a food system that does not deliver safe, affordable, nutritious food. And Lawrence, you stated the, the headline of across the world, 3 billion people pre-pandemic could not afford a healthy diet. And we know the pandemic projections are from the uh, International Food Policy Research Institute, that's likely to increase about by 10%, by about 267 million. And it's also important to know, you know, this is not on the margins. This is actually existential for many families that the ongoing uh, impacts of the pandemic are projected to result in around 13.6 
million additional children suffering from wasting, the most uh, deadly form of malnutrition, and that combined with drop in access to nutrition service, services could result in over 280,000 additional children's deaths. Um, so we, we know the food system is failing to deliver nutritious food, uh, safe food, and that is affordable and accessible. And as others have said, we're in this midst of this food system's transformation uh, that more and more uh, consumers across the world, be they urban, peri-urban or rural, in fact, do rely on markets. And the most essential player in those markets, the most essential interface between the private sector and the populations who need nutritious food are these small and medium enterprises. Uh, one of the additional impacts of the pandemic is not just the increases that the potential backslide on nutrition, but then the increase in the needed financial resources and the global nutrition report estimated that currently we're facing about a uh, $10.8 billion gap in nutrition financing per annum. And so we absolutely need to look at innovative ways to uh, close this gap. Um, the, and Lawrence, you laid it out, not, you know, I think of the COVID pandemic was a stressor on the food system that hit us like an asteroid. We've been having a stressor on the food system that's probably even more existential that's been coming at us for decades and will be with us for decades, the climate crisis. And we certainly need to be in a situation where we have food systems who can respond to that and produce more nutritious food. Um, the, so how do we do it? Because we painted a grim picture, but now let's focus on solutions. Uh, in, for the US government, as we have refreshed our global food security strategy, uh, which underpins Feed the Future, we've really looked at what are the levers we can use to really help our partner governments and our partner institutions transform food systems in a way that will increase access and affordability of safe, nutritious foods. And when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we see that uh, small and medium enterprises are responsible for uh, roughly 75% of all foods consumed. And Lawrence, I like what you said, these are the Gold Goldilocks, right? Because they're the actual backbone of the food system, but they're also the ones neglected because they're not too little and they're not too, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not little enough and they're not big enough. And in many cases, uh, these, uh, these, Small and medium enterprises are often uh, led by women, often uh, support a lot of employment by women. So there are many, many knock-on effects that are all positive. Uh, we do think that the Nutritious Foods Financing Facility, affectionately known as N3F, uh, provides a unique opportunity, uh, not just to deliver on healthy diets, but to demonstrate the impact of investing in local small and medium enterprises. And really to, and I think as Lawrence, you said, really the demonstration impact, because this it alone will not solve it, but having this quality proof of concept and proof of scale, proof of demonstration, I think can really provide a pathway forward for larger scale transformation. Um, now, initially we thought at USAID uh, that our role would be more on providing the technical assistance, but we also recognize that we need to have even more skin in the game. Uh, and so we have committed $1 million to the uh, Nutritious Foods Financing Facility First Lost Tranche. We're extremely proud of making this commitment in collaboration with other commitments from GAIN itself. It's really proof of skin in the game when an organization puts its own limited unrestricted resources in this and to our partner, the Eleanor Crook Foundation. So really uh, thanks so much to the parties here and we're eager to have others join us on this journey, which we do think can start creating the demonstration that we can work productively with small and medium enterprises to transform food systems to really address this enormous gap in access and affordability of safe, nutritious foods. Thank you and back over to you, Roberta.
Thank you, Sean. And uh, yeah, thank you for, you know, highlighting the, the role of uh, small and medium enterprises in delivering safe and nutritious foods. And uh, particularly, um, thank you for uh, the support and the backing uh, for, for Entry F as part of your strategy, your broader strategy, transforming um, food systems. Um, now we have a short video from the Eleanor Cook Foundation, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but do want to tell you about their support to Entry F and their value to see in this type of partnerships. So here are the video. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you all today for this Nutrition for Growth side event showcasing the Nutritious Food Financing Facility, a first of its kind investment fund. My name is Kim Cernak and I have the honor of serving as the Managing Director at the Eleanor Crick Foundation. For those of you who don't know us, ECF is a US-based private philanthropy, and we're exclusively focused on the fight against global malnutrition. We invest in on-the-ground research that shows us how to effectively end malnutrition. We invest in advocacy that makes the case for why, and we are always searching for innovative solutions to tackle global hunger and malnutrition. And that's why we were excited to announce our support of M3F earlier this year. As this audience will well know, today, malnutrition is a child's worst enemy. It's the number one killer of kids in this world, claiming the lives of nearly 3 million children under the age of five each year. Malnutrition also stunts brain development, and it robs individuals and societies of their ability to grow into their full potential. Children who are malnourished early in life are likely to learn less at school and to earn less as adults. Reducing malnutrition can save and improve lives. It can also increase a country's economic productivity by as much as 11%. Now, today we're experiencing one of the largest hunger spikes in 20 years. Billions of people around the world are surviving mostly on empty calories, plate after plate of rice, cassava, or maize, with very little protein or other nutrients that bodies and brains need to perform. Nutritious food is often just too expensive for families to buy. Smart investments in nutritious food supply chains, food fortification, food safety, and food quality can change that. These are exactly the types of investments that N3F will make, all with the goal of saving lives and building stronger economies. ECF's investment in N3F is part of a larger commitment we have made for financing for small and medium enterprises. Earlier this year, we were honored to be part of President Biden's commitment to fight global and hunger and malnutrition announced at the UN Food Systems Summit. There, he announced that USAID would join an ongoing collaboration with the US Development Finance Corporation and the Eleanor Crick Foundation to mobilize at least $100 million of financing over five years to leverage private sector solutions to reduce malnutrition globally. Solutions like M3F. We are so pleased to be part of this vibrant community, working to establish and to support N3F. Each of our organizations brings significant expertise to this fund and to the partnership, but we also know that our success will only be as good as the other partners and champions that we bring to it. We hope you'll join us. Thanks to Kim for sharing Eleanor Crooks Foundation support to N3F. Now moving on to the next part of our event. Um, during Lauren's opening remarks, we heard about the partnership between Gain and Incofin and how the two organizations complement each other, leveraging um, Gain's deep nutrition expertise and Incofin's solid investing track record. We're very happy that David Dewes, Managing Partner, Incofin Investment Management, is joining us today. And I would like to welcome Lawrence back to the session for an open discussion with David about the entry of design and offering. So Lawrence and David, over to you both. David, I think I'm starting off this conversation. So I was so pleased, thank you, Roberta, and I was so pleased to hear from Sean and Kim uh, about their um, backing of innovation in this space. You know, we like to think of ourselves in the nutrition community as really innovative, innovative in our programs, our policy, our data, our research, but we haven't really been that innovative in the financing space. So I really applaud um, USAID and Ellen Crook Foundation for, for really pushing, pushing everybody, not just through N3F, but through this bigger commitment 
uh, to be more innovative and think hard about how to crowd resources into this, as Kim said, uh, space to, to combat children's worst enemy, malnutrition. Uh, David, um, Gain has never partnered with a uh, investment fund manager, a fund manager before. So here's, here's a testimony to an innovative partnership. Um, and could you just, David, uh, David, could you just tell us a bit about why N3F needs to be a blended financing facility? And if you could tell us a bit about the kinds of SMEs it's going to uh, support, that'd be great. Yes. So. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, the fund impact basis states that by providing targeted funding and technical assistance for SMEs supporting the, the supply of nutritious and safe foods in Africa, we, we can improve diets of lower uh, income consumer and incentivize a more efficient food system, including for smallholders. Uh, our approach has three pillars, a blended structure on the liability side of the fund, a variety of loan products on the asset side of the fund and a TA program. All the three are essential uh, to really uh, achieve the purpose of the fund. A blended approach is therefore necessary considering the inno innovative nature, as you, you have mentioned before, of the fund by being the first dedicated fund to focus on improving nutrition in sub-Saharan Africa. And also by the fact that it will be an, an impact first fund both, of course, implying a set of new opportunities, but also of additional risks. So therefore, it is essential to uh, start uh, as a first uh, dedicated fund to start with a blended finance uh, approach. As for your second question, N3F plans to focus on SMEs across the different stages of the, of the nutritious value chain, from input providers, food production, processing companies, to dis distribution and marketing. In terms of geography, we will develop a diverse uh, portfolio across Sub-Saharan Africa, making sure that we will cover SMEs in East, West, Central and South Africa. Uh, diversity is key from a risk, but also from an impact perspective. Okay, uh, David, back over to you. I think you can ask me a question. Yes, uh, so of course, the N3F support goes beyond financing yeah? and it has been designed with a technical assistant component alongside with the financing one. To support the capacity building of SME, Lawrence, would you like to elaborate on the reasons for including technical assistance and what would gain role uh, be in it? Uh, thanks, David. I mean, the TA is essential because you need to make sure the power of finance really does unleash the power of SMEs to, to deliver nutritious foods. And so there are, there are three types of TA I think we can, we're, we're planning on seeing and, and meeting the needs of. The first is sort of strict business development work. It, it's, it's, it's core business model work, core nuts and bolts of business development. Uh, GAIN has done quite a lot of that, but we're going to act as a clearinghouse and a matchmaker to link SMEs to, to other uh, business development providers for the general stuff. Uh, for the nutrition dimensions of the business model, you know, which standards, which foods, which partners, which technology, which processes, which marketing approaches to choose, we will be providing uh, all of that um, a TA advice and support with, with key partners, of course, in the four countries or the more, more than four countries that we'll be working in. And finally, the third type of TA is really around metrics. Um, there are four ultimate outcomes in our, in our theory of change and our log frame, um, more available and accessible nutritious foods, reduced food loss, more nutritious foods through reformulation, and of course, safer foods. Those are the four ultimate outcomes. But behind those four ultimate outcomes, there are 10 immediate outcomes. And behind those 10 immediate outcomes, there are 20 outputs. So this is all quite technical, um, but this is why we're so confident of having a social, i.e. nutrition, impact, because the nutrition design aspects will be um, built in to, into the business model to achieve these outputs and outcomes. Um, Roberta, I think back to you. Thank you, David and Lawrence, for you know, highlighting the three pillars, the unique features of N3F, 
beyond financing. So looking at the aspect of technical assistance as well as the, the impact and the metrics. Um, now for, um, for our panel discussions, um, moving to the next stage um, of our session, I would like to welcome several new speakers uh, representing different voices. So um, from the SME demand side, as well as the supply side of capital. And together we will explore NTRF's role in empowering SMEs to increase access to nutritious and safe food. Um, and I would like to welcome uh, the following speakers. Firstly, uh, Ms. Winnie Wandimi. Um, Ms. Winnie is a Kenyan entrepreneur who in 2008 um, founded um, with Wimsy Limited, a dairy processing company she owns and where she currently serves as a managing director. Um, secondly, um, Ms. Sambe, uh, Mr. Sambe Lee, apologies, Sambe, who is the agricultural um, finance team lead at the US Agency for International Development, bringing significant expertise from the financial sector and impact investing space. Um, I've spent about over eight years managing an international portfolio of microfinance and SME lenders. And finally, a warm welcome to Mr. Jesse Karadi, who is the Managing Director for Africa at the US International Development Corporation, better known as DFC. Jesse oversees DFC investment strategy in Africa. Um, so um, for our panel discussion, uh, Winnie, I would like to start with a question for you. Um, as a female entrepreneur um, with over 30 years in agribusiness, can you share some insights on the challenges faced by female owned or led businesses when trying to access finance? I'm not sure if we have um, Winnie on the spotlight. I think she's Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? We do hear you. Hi, Winnie. I'm fine. Um, you have done a very good intro. And I want to thank you, all of you, for this, um, this great opportunity for women entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurs in large. What I can share about the struggles for entrepreneurs in uh, the SME, I'll give a small story of how WIMC was born. WIMC began in Kenya in 2008. In 2008, the Kenyan market had a lot of milk. And being one of the child of a farmer, we had a lot of milk. Going to the other side, I was, as I was doing my research in a, in a slum, I found out that there were people who would not be able to access the nutrition because they could not afford it. So looking at the farmer side and looking at the nutritional side, came up with an idea of how I could connect the two. And that's how WMC was born. As a, as a women entrepreneur, there are many challenges that I've come across, which covers most of us as women entrepreneurs and small SMEs. First is when you walk into a bank looking for some financing, sometimes you have no that collateral. So even getting that finance, you might have the idea, you want to connect the farmer and the, new, and the, and the, and the low income earners in, in getting the nutritional value, but you have no collateral to stand in that bank. So sometimes you're not able to access that finance. Also, a few, a few of, um, and on most of the, the entrepreneurs, they don't have the right way to collect the data. So sometimes you have a very good idea, you have a very good enterprise, but you don't have the finances even to have the data collected, even as you do your market research. So those are many of the issues that uh, this, the, the entrepreneurs face. They also don't have the access to the market. You might have all the products, but you're not able to access even that market. Uh, so many women and many entrepreneurs face a challenge of finance. So this will be a very good idea. This is a, the best thing that uh, GAIN and Incofin has, has done to the SMEs, and it will go a long way to serve the, the many people that are lacking nutrition in Africa. As I was also doing my research um, in the slum, I found out that uh, 
you will find a family like the family i will give an example of one family that i attended to the, the, the mother is a housewife a single mother with three children they could not they had only three dollars as an nanny and the only access was one dollar for food so that's how whimsy came up with some some product that would meet their needs give them whole food for an affordable price so this is a good thing that uh, that uh, i can echo and say that uh, lawrence and uh, david you have done the best for africa and it will take us very far thank you so much Thank you, and like, and thank you for you know for sharing with us the the story of how Whimsy came together, and you know, and uh, and how it the idea is to meet the needs of families that uh, don't have access otherwise to um, affordable and nutritious food. Um, and you've talked a little bit about uh, the challenges as an entrepreneur that you faced when uh, trying to access finance, um, and um, and you mentioned collateral, but you also mentioned sometimes um, data might be a challenge. Challenge. So be beyond financing, because uh, you you mentioned how entry F could be a value, but beyond financing, can you can you share with us a little bit about the the benefits that you would see um, in technical assistance from from an SME perspective, uh, and if there are any areas, for example, that would be um, of good benefit uh, to um, an SME like Wimsey. Thank you. There are many there are many areas that uh, the TA would really help in um, the entrepreneurs. First is like even the business planning. Many people carry on an idea. You have no business planning. I'm one of the beneficiaries of uh, Gain, who taught us about uh, the planning, the business planning, and I'm also a beneficiary of Gain in uh, safety, food safety. So I know that it really took us a, a, a very high milestone because initially as we were, we started, we, we, we did not have the, the safety, we did not have the, the product well developed. And through that and, and many, many other benefits, just like the way we benefited in such trainings of product development, they can benefit in the safety of the food, knowing how to fortify thing products so i am we have really benefited from gain on this and uh, now with a bit of marketing and uh, sell, and, and sales just to meet the bop market so this can really be of great help thank you Thank you, Winnie, and thank you for highlighting the different aspects that can support an SME uh, from, from some that you might have already benefit and some others that you think could be of help, like the, the marketing and how to reach uh, BOP. Um, um, I'm, I'm now going to move, like, um, going back to the to the broader question um, around um, accessing financing, and I would like to ask the, the, the next question to Songbe. Um, so given your knowledge of the broader financial landscape around agriculture and nutrition, what is the current status of funding available for nutrition when compared to other sectors and needs? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so I think uh, uh, Sean mentioned earlier about $10.8 billion. And I'm not sure if it's the same data that I was looking at. I can't remember the exact number, but I think the thing to point out about it is that most of that money is expected to come from public sources. And I, by that, I mean government spending and grants. And a smaller portion, but we think a very, um, uh, is a smaller portion is expected to come from the private sector, but we think that the private sector has an important role and opportunity to, opportunity to play. And when I say from the private sector, I'm talking exactly about the kind of products that David was talking about that the N3F um, will provide, uh, loans. Um, and, the, the, the second level, uh, oh, I just want to point out, because I think when you talk about this to people in the nutrition sector, one thing they're concerned about is this is reallocating money. And they definitely, that government spending and those grants are essential. And so we're not trying to take away, we're not reallocating the pie, we're just working on growing the overall size of the pie. So I just wanted to emphasize that point. I just also wanted to talk about maybe at a little bit more specific level at USAID. And traditionally, USAID has been a funder in the nutrition sector, and they started shifting their focus over 
uh, more to their role as a convener, and as also mentioned earlier, as providing their technical assistance. And that's exactly how we originally approached our partnership with GAIN and Incofin on N3F, uh, providing the input on the design, providing, providing funding for the actual setup of the fund. But we realized that there's two important things that investors are looking for that were that was missing, or well, wasn't missing, but two important things one is some sort of de-risking mechanism, whether that's a guarantee or first loss catalytic tranche. And the second thing also Sean mentioned is skin in the game. So, you know, what, what didn't exist wasn't on our radar in the beginning, which is definitely a key focus of ours, of ours now is that um, providing commitment from USAID into the catalytic tranche to show that, you know, not only do we believe in the development impact thesis, but we believe in the investment thesis. And we hope that encourages other people to join us in supporting um, N3F. Thank you, Song Ben. Thank you, you know, for for highlighting how we all believe it's really important to to expand the whole the the overall size of the pie, right? Not just reallocating and um, and uh, USAID's uh, role as in catalyzing private investment is is a great step in the right direction because uh, obviously. Um, it's uh, it's you know it's that skin in the game that hopefully will um, will bring others um, to join us along the journey. Um, and in this context, as you're saying, uh, obviously, um, um, as you're mentioning, USAID um, backing N3F. Could you tell us um, why you believe N3F is the right solution to increase access to nutritious foods, and what is it that makes it different? We'll start off by saying I don't know if it's the right solution, but I think it's something that we think is worthwhile to test and we're building it as we go. I mean, I'll also say that I think there's this tendency for donors to want to always create new funds. Um, and that's something I try to resist. I mean, the first thing anyone I would tell people if they say they want to start a new fund is no. You know, why don't we go out there and find an existing vehicle that we can kind of work through? But I think in this case, there was an argument for doing something new. Uh, because it is so new, it is untested, that we had to go out there and prove it ourselves first. And then what we hope is after this proof of concept that we can go out there and have other ag funds focusing on SMEs adopt the same approach. So I think really that's one measure of success is that after N3F does this, that it gets more broadly accepted. One thing you know I just would highlight is I think is very unique about this approach is that the investment thesis was designed by nutrition and development experts, but then it's vetted and actually executed by investment professionals. So I really do think this was like a, a great you know um, partnership bringing different players that you know we 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 come across each other, but so intentionally coming together where our interests overlap and building something new. That, that I do, I mean, I don't know if it's the right answer, but I, I do believe, uh, I, I would say, I do believe it is um, the right way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Songbe. Um, and uh, I guess my next question is, is going to be for Jesse. Um, I mean, um, earlier this year, your organization, DFC, uh, together with Enrico Foundation and USAID announced the Global Nutrition Financing Alliance to mobilize about 100 million financing to tackle malnutrition um, over the course of five years. Can you tell us um, a little bit more about this alliance? Absolutely, Roberta. And I, I wanna thank everyone here on the panel, Songbei and Winnie, um, pleasure to be here. Lawrence, David, Sean as well, thank you. Um, great to be here today. Um, happy to, to talk a bit about our, our partnership, um, which Kim actually flagged as well, helpfully at the beginning of the session. Um, I, I do maybe want to start by talking a little bit about DFC's strategy broadly within the food security space and, and in particular uh, within the nutrition space. Um, this has been an area of focus for the DFC um, over the last couple of years, and we've been working to amplify that and to really extend our, our reach where possible. Um, so a couple things that we've actually done to do that. Um, one is we've set up uh, a dedicated food security uh, team, uh, deal team actually, that is focused on uh, agricultural and food security related deals, um, including nutrition, um, which as we've heard, uh, Winnie very helpfully, I think, provided some texture on the challenges that, that businesses face uh, in accessing the financing that they need. Uh, I think Songbei highlighted the you know, very, very useful support of obviously the private sector and private capital. Um, we thought that as the DFC um, 
what would be incredibly helpful in partnership with USAID and, and, and others who are leading our, our food security efforts uh, across the US government is to actually have an investment team that is exclusively focused on this very important uh, and critically uh, uh, sort of developmentally relevant sector for, for food security and nutrition. Um, so really moving, I guess, to the, the partnership that we have with Eleanor Crook, um, as you rightly pointed out, and again, as Kim mentioned, um, it's a commitment to uh, invest up to $100 million over the next five years in nutrition-focused businesses, um, either directly or indirectly. Um, so we are very eager and keen to explore opportunities that, that fit within that space. And 3F, of course, being a, a, a very interesting example of that. Um, and I would say more broadly, beyond our, our, our partnership with Eleanor Crook and, and with USAID uh, in particular, um, we as the DFC have committed, uh, again, with, with the new food security team that we have and our broader uh, investment teams mm -hmm. to actually target a billion dollars worth of food security and agricultural uh, projects and investments over five years. Um, and so, you know, again, I think we've, we've certainly um, aimed very high and, and, and expect uh, a great deal of success and, and transaction volume from DFC from a dollar perspective. Um, and I think we're, we're very excited and eager to be working um, with USAID, with Eleanor Crook um, and others, frankly, um, to be able to bring our resources in the most impactful way uh, to help try to solve these, these challenging issues. Thank you, Jesse. And I, I mean, impressive and very excited to hear about, you know, such an uh, incredible target for from DFC in terms of, uh, you know, um, impact in the, in the food security space over the next five years. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very, very happy and pleased to hear that. And um, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, between uh, within the, the scope of this alliance, uh, you mentioned uh, entry F would be an example. Could you could you explain a little bit uh, how and 3F would fit within, um, within the alliance and um, how does it align with the objectives? Sure, absolutely. I, I think there are a few key points. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned is we, we think about this, I think, both from a direct investment perspective as well as a sort of indirect or intermediated um, investment perspective. Um, I think this falls very squarely within our sort of intermediated, uh, almost fund of funds approach that we would take here. Um, and I think that there are, there are tremendous opportunities for scale, um, for localized expertise um, to drive those kinds of investments through these types of vehicles. And so, um, you know, we, through our food security team and frankly, outside of it, um, have done a combination of both these sort of direct investments um, directly into um, producers and others within the agricultural value chain, but also see huge value. Um, to investing in those uh, funds and fund vehicles who can who can intermediate and, and directly in, uh, invest that capital um, into these very important sectors, including obviously in nutrition. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of opportunity there. We're very excited about that, um, and I think that N3F certainly fits within that that indirect bucket that I'm alluding to. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, you know, for for sharing a little bit of of light on DFC's approach, both the direct one and uh, uh, the approach via funds of funds um, vehicles like like Entry F and how that can fit into the broader picture of how DFC is approaching the um, um, its strategy for food security. Um, I I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers, and I think we. We will now have uh, about, I think we should be on time. So we should have about 10 minutes um, of Q&A uh, and we'll be able to, I mean, we've been receiving several questions from the audience. And so we'll take this opportunity to pose a few questions um, to our speakers. Um, let me start with the first question for um, Lawrence. Um, the fund will be targeting medium-sized SMEs with a turnover of uh, over $1 million. The majority of processors of nutritious food uh, processors in the sub-Saharan region are in the range of $300,000 to $1 million. Are there conversations to reach these SMEs, even if for TA support? 
Yeah, great question. I mean, my understanding is that N3F may reach down to half a million turnover, not not be stuck only at a million. But again, as an organization, we have uh, we just we're just setting up something called the uh, Nutrition Enterprise Hub, which we're rather um, rather uh, strangely calling Enterprise, just with an N, uh, for nutrition. And uh, we think it's really going to be important because it brings together the kinds of um, collectivization work that the Sun Business Network does around voice and and, and community of practice work uh, and connecting uh, together with N3F, together with a whole suite of um, TA work that is targeted to the to the smaller SMEs, the micro uh, SMEs. So we, we're seeing a whole flow of of SMEs from, you know, the Sun Business Network identifies, collectivizes, uh, and develops and creates a community. Some of the smaller SMEs are provided TA support, maybe small grants, and then hopefully they will graduate to N3F. So I think uh, I think there's a nice flow and a nice continuum under the umbrella of Enterprise. Back to you, Roberta. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, yeah, and I think it's like, um, I mean, the next one that um, I'm kind of probably directed to Sangbe, like, um, here we go. There's a question for uh, Sangbe Lee. Um, the question is, if I understood you right, you stated that the majority of that 10 USD, US dollar billions should come from the public sector. Generally, I would reason that we need to design blended finance structure that leverage private sector financing, at least in a one to two ratio. One third from a public sector, mainly for the de-risking, and a minimum two thirds from a private sector. Can you please clarify your statement? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, um, Ben. So first of all, to clarify, I'm not a doctor. Um, a second is, when I talk about the 10 billion, I'm talking about where the traditional source of nutrition funding has come from and saying that 10 billion is coming from public sources. And I expect that 10 billion to continue to come from public sport sources to be spent on the kind of things that they're doing, not mobilizing private capital. So what we're talking about is some incremental portion on top of that 10 billion, where we can come in and create a facility like N3F. And so as, as far as to your more specific question, what is the right amount of leverage? So the first thing I'll say is that, you know, I, I try to stay away from leverage amounts because I think it's hard to compare. It's never apples to apples, but of course it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's an evil. I forget what the, um, not, that's not the right term, but it's a, it's something we need to live with because it's something that's a headline number that we always use. But really, I think it's, it's not even probably the, the best metric, even, even less so in this case, because we're really what we're talking about is trying to do a market systems approach. In this case, we are going to be working with individual transactions. We will, we, will, we will be mobilizing capital. There'll be capital leveraged, let's say, our public dollars from USAID going into the fund. You know, what is the right leverage we can calculate? Let's say we put a million in and the fund gets to 50 million. You know, are we really talking 50 times leverage? Is it just so? And then the reason I say it's beyond that is that once N3F is developed, then we want whatever processes they put in place, the investment thesis, the investment criteria for investing across the food system to increase nutrition outcomes through the increased availability and consumption of safe and nutritious foods, for all of that to be adopted by other funds. So, you know, and we're not gonna go out there and claim those, those dollars as leverage on our original investment into the catalytic crunch, but that's our overall, our overall vision. So um, I think you asked a very specific question. And if you want, we can have that discussion about the actual structure of N3F and how much is in the catalytic tranche versus in the senior tranche that will be leveraged. But for us, I think that the goal is, is much broader. Thank you very much, Songbe. Um, I'm going to move to a next question, um, which is, um, can you elaborate on the type of consumers you are targeting, urban, peri-urban, or rural consumers? Um, I guess I can I can probably take this one, and then I'll, I'll ask um, Winnie to share a little bit about the consumers that she's targeting, for example, with uh, with her company, um, Whimsy. So um, on our end, um, the entry F is, um, is basically motivated um, to increase access to safe and food, uh, nutritious foods for low and middle income consumers. Um, and, that, um, and that obviously can be um, urban, peri-urban or rural 
the idea is to increase access um, to those mostly needs. Um, uh, but I think also for for more concrete examples, it would be it would be also nice to hear probably from from Winnie about you know you might have some data on um, and on your target customers. Yeah, our target customers are the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, those are the people that are chronically in need of that uh, nutrition. So, and they are the many, they, they, co they constitute most of like 80% of the, the whole of Africa. So in Kenya, they, we are about 90%. So our target market is that the bottom of the pyramid, and those are the low income earners, but we have a lot of children and women. So those are our target. Thank you, Winnie. Um, the next question is um, is probably for Jesse Songbe. Um, what will differentiate um, this funding for from the commercial capital available to SMEs, mostly by local banks? And I guess that that can be Songbe or also like David. Feel free to jump in as well. I can I can take a quick stab at it, and this is mostly because of what David's told me before. So to make sure I understand it correctly, I think the interesting thing is, first of all, we understand, you know, there's this point that I think Roberta made earlier, not only is the financing going to SMEs mostly in cash crops like cocoa and coffee, which is fine from a livelihoods perspective, but not really an answer for local consumption for safe and um, safe, nutritious foods. The second thing is the type of capital they receive is typically short term working capital. So that's not going to, it's, it's not as much for investing in the business to grow the business. But you see something similar happening even with SMEs that work with the local food crops is that they might have access to some local, uh, local lines from lines from local banks, but not enough to help, not enough to invest in, into maybe a new factor, a processing facility or some, um, some new equipment. And second, it's usually not longer term. And th those are usually you know, related. Some fixed asset and investment is going to take longer term uh, financing. And let me pass it over to David, because I think one of the real unique things about N3F is the longer term financing that it can provide. Indeed, thank you, Songbe. Uh, in fact, uh, in parallel to, to the development of the fund, we are constantly working uh, around the pipeline building and, and continuously conducting surveys. And what we have found out is uh, that basically those surveys uh, validate and confirm the huge financial gap that these companies are facing. Most of them are actually uh, receiving some financing from local entities indeed. Uh, nevertheless, and they are totally underserved. For example, companies with funding needs between one or two million dollars are currently served uh, between 200 and 300 thousand uh, dollars. So there is a clear gap. Uh, and this is because the local banks tend to assess those entities based on real collateral rather than on these SMEs uh, real absorption capacity. And so um, in terms of products, uh, so in, indeed what we want to, to, to do with N3F is not only to provide additional working capital uh, loans, uh, but also to provide long-term uh, uh, loans in, in order to support them making uh, important investments to, to, to build their, their, their company and, and, and bring them to, to, the, to the next uh, level, basically. Yeah, thank you both Songbei and David for, you know, um, uh, sharing why, you know, uh, why is it different what N3F is, uh, is offering with respect to um, a product that um, SMEs could access uh, in their current markets. And, and probably just talking about uh, markets, um, David, just, you, you know, you mentioned right now about uh, the pipeline. Um, can you share a little bit more about um, the countries that we're looking at um, and basically the, uh, the geographic focus of N3F? Well, I think it's clear that it's sub-Saharan Africa, and what we want is a diverse uh, selection of countries. Of course, we will prioritize countries in which uh, GAIN and INCOFIN have uh, presence or uh, historical, uh, let's say, uh, uh, experience uh, working in, in, in these countries. But uh, 
currently the, the pipeline that we are building includes uh, SMEs uh, from West Africa, from Central Africa, from uh, the southern part of Africa and from East Africa, of course, as well. So it will be an interesting and diversified portfolio in terms of geography. Thank you, David. And uh, I think we can probably try and ask uh, and answer one last question. Um, can you please clarify if this fund is open to all agribusiness or is there a criteria uh, that will be used to define uh, what you consider safe and nutritious food? Um, I guess, um, David, happy for you to, to start and I can follow up or Lawrence as well. I can jump in, um, but uh, Brent, great question. We do have, I just typed my answer into the, the Q&A box. We do have a, GAIN as a whole has a definition of what safe and nutritious food is, because that's part of our core purpose, to improve the consumption of safe and nutritious food for all, especially the most vulnerable. But we've just, we've just uh, I think this week or next week, just about to publish a, a paper on, on this, uh, exactly for this, for N3F and other related uh, projects, other related initiatives. But yeah, I'm happy to send that to you, Brent. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, and, and I guess, I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking at time um, and maybe what, what we can do. Um, I was just thinking about uh, if there are any in answer question, what we can do is uh, maybe we can try and, um, and answer to them um, uh, with, uh, with our recording in the blog. Uh, but um, I'll just take the occasion to um, thank you. Thanks all of our um, all of our speakers um, and thank you Winnie, Sangbe, uh, Jesse uh, for your insights and participation. Um, and uh, before before we leave, I'd like to hand over to David and Lawrence for some closing remarks. Uh, maybe first uh, over to you, David. Thank you. Yes, I just want to highlight that this is a, a collaborative approach. We are really uh, working in strong partnership between different entities, as you have seen. And this is certainly going to be the, 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 the st strong and the strength of, of this uh, new fund. But I also wanted to, to mention that by developing a, a blended finance uh, structure for N3F, uh, we believe that it gives the opportunity for different profiles of investors and, and donors to participate in this new project. And, and therefore, I mean, I would call and invite uh, those inter interested parties to, to join uh, us in this effort. Thank you, David. And uh, yeah, we, we definitely look forward to continue our um, entry of journey with uh, with Incofin. Uh, and, you know, we are certain that our partnership will, will benefit from, you know, the great experience that you have in the investment field. Um, Lawrence, um, I would like to ask you to ask uh, to as well to, to add some final thoughts, please. Uh, thank you, Roberta. I'd just like to thank all the panelists and participants uh, for great great presentations, great statements, great questions, great answers. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, i just leave you with a couple of points. Um, Songbei really, really summarized it nicely. He said, uh, nutrition and development professionals developed the investment thesis, and yet we have hard-nosed, rigorous financial professionals executing that thesis. And that and he, he he said it was intentional, and it was intentional. And I think if you're going to be a if you're going to be a pioneer and have a pioneer spirit, you have to have that intentionality. Um, but being a pioneer, and I, I hope I don't sound too self-aggrandizing by saying that N3F is a is a has a pioneering spirit. And I think being a pioneer is is not easy. the The risk is high, and the reward is high. And I think we've done a really a thorough job of minimizing and managing the risk in order to benefit and generate a massive reward for nutrition. It's not easy to be a pioneer. It's not comfortable to be a pioneer, but it's a whole lot easier uh, and a whole lot more likely to succeed if we have great partners. And I think we already have a great set of partners and I, we really want to grow that, that partnership, not just financial partnership, but thought leadership and, uh, and implementation leadership as well. So thank you, everybody. And thank you to Roberta for your leadership of this initiative. Back to you. 
Thank you, Lawrence. And I guess uh, a final thank you to all our speakers, organizers, to our audience. Um, as Lawrence just mentioned, yes, uh, indeed, um, um, tricky to be pioneering, uh, but um, at the same time, really exciting to have um, uh, Entry F pioneering with an innovative financial approach for investing in nutrition. And we look forward to engaging with all of you as we continue on this shared journey. So thank you. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You.